السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مذل له ومن يذل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد العبد ورسوله أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين قال لهم الناس إن الناس قد جمعوا لكم فخشوهم فزادهم إيمانا إيمانا وقالوا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل صدق الله العظيم وصدق مولانا النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك ومن الشاهدين ومن الشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين it is a great blessing and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has bestowed upon us an opportunity to come to His house once again. And to come in His house and sit and listen to His remembrance. And come and sit and listen to the mention of His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In Surah Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals, Those who are warned, your enemies have mobilized their forces against you, so fear them. The warning only made them grow stronger in faith. And they replied, Allah alone is sufficient as an aid for us. And he is the best protector. Ibn al Sayyib reported Maymuna said to him, O oh my nephew, shall I not invoke over you the incantation of the Messenger of Allah? I said, Of course. Maymuna said, In the name of Allah, I invoke over you. May Allah heal you from every ailment. Take away your pain, O Lord of the people, and heal it for you are the healer. There is no healing without you. And this is the dua she made, which she had learned from the Prophet ﷺ. So anytime we face a difficulty, anytime we face an illness, anytime we face anything of the sort, we should immediately turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him for complete health. That we're not like the Prophet ﷺ, who could be making dua for us 1400 years before us with that emotion. We don't have that level of iman. I'm sorry to say, it's like, I know I don't. I don't know about everybody else. Maybe there's some, mashallah, subhanAllah, some great Sufi amongst us, but I don't know. It doesn't seem like that that level will be achieved in our lifetime. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. But one of the things which we have to understand is, I know people, they love to argue and agree and disagree on fiqhi, masail. They like to discuss very deep-rooted things, right? Right? Deep-rooted things. This is not what builds your iman. You know, this is not what builds your iman. This will not build your iman. You know, knowing whether following the Shafi fiqh if you travel or following the Hanafi fiqh if you travel, how many rakat should you pray, where you, where you become a musafir, things like this, they're not going to enrich your iman. How you enrich your iman or your faith is when you build the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when any calamity befalls you, when any calamity befalls you, you turn immediately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anytime anything happens, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'am al wakil. And, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the best protector. This is what's the first thing that comes to your mind. When you get into a close situation where it seems like you're about to have an accident, right? Your car is about to crash into another car. What are the first words that come out of your mouth? <coughs> Na'udhu billah, for many Muslims, even when they're in that situation, you know the first words that come out of their mouth because they've heard it so much is Jesus. So we have to train our minds, we have to train our bodies for the first thing that comes out of our mouth is Ya Allah, protect me. Ya Allah, save me. And this is a whole lifestyle, right? This is not just doing one thing or another thing and that's it. Being a Muslim is a complete lifestyle. It is a complete mindset. It is a complete mindset, right? I'm one of those people, I think that each and every person sitting here has enough intellectual strength to be a strong, firm Muslim. This is why you're here. This is why you're here. You have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't want to miss Jum'ah at least. This is why you're here. This is why you're sitting here. And this is why a few days out of the week you'll make it to salah and you'll pray a few prayers with Jama'ah in the masjid. You have that, that strength that you know you need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for each and every one of us, if all we're looking at is, oh, well, the people below me, they're not doing as much as me. No, that's a shortcoming. I can't be looking at society like that. I can't be looking at my brothers and sisters like that. 
I should be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all and to forgive anybody who has any shortcomings, but I should be looking at the people above me, the next level up, right? If you see an army coming, an army coming, 10,000 men, and your platoon has 100 men, right? What should be the first thing that comes out of your mouth? Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the, the one who gives victory and you are the one who gives defeat. Give us victory from the jaws of defeat. This is what you should ask. This is why when we look at the life of Hazrat Khalid bin Walid, the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we look at his life, we see when he was not a Muslim, he didn't fear when he was in the battlefield. But when he became Muslim, he still had that quality of not having any fear. But now he was motivated. Not motivated to just win. He wanted that victory, right? He wanted that victory. But now he wanted to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside that victory, right? When you give a person a mission, when you give a person a purpose, they work twice, thrice, four times as hard to reach the end goal because they know what they're going to get out of it. And he kept fighting. His whole body was filled with marks of swords and arrows and different sorts of weapons. You know what? He would keep fighting. He didn't die in the battlefield. He was really, he was very saddened. He was filled with sorrow that he didn't die in the battlefield because this is what he desired. But when he was told, what he was told is you are the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can never be broken. And if you died in the battlefield, the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have been broken. Henceforth, you didn't die in the battlefield. He got solace from that because he knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from him. He knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desired from him. And when he was removed from being the general of the army, so that the Muslims would know that we don't win just because we're on the backs of Khalid bin Walid anhu, but rather we win because we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking out for us, right? Each and every one of us should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking out for each and every one of us sitting over here. So when any calamity befalls us, who do we turn to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's who we turn to, right? Anything bad happens in our life, no other words come out of our mouth. We have to train our mind. We have to train our body to be like this. And this is why many times, you know, I, I don't get into this. This is, you know, a fiqh, a fiqh matter of consumption of halal and haram, what is considered halal and haram. <coughs> but we should strive to consume that of which is, which is halal, which is permissible for us, right? Whatever method of slaughter you follow, whatever shuyukh you follow, that's your personal matter. Contact a good shaykh, talk with him, and he will explain to you these masal. But we should strive to consume. And you know why? Because this is a mindset. It's a mindset issue. If we don't keep our mindset that we're always looking to do what's permissible, we'll see ourselves start to slip. We'll see ourselves start to slip. That in one matter, we'll be like, okay, this is okay. You know, it's not a big deal. You know, maybe I ate some McDonald's chicken nuggets today. Tomorrow you'll take the next step. You'll be like, okay, now I want a Big Mac. You know, this is just an example. I'm not trying to prevent anybody from eating anything or telling you to eat something. But I'm just giving you an example. Um, we should stay away from McDonald's anyway because the way they prepare their food is just, you know, despicable anyway. Um, but, but just in general, when you start yourself, when you, when you see yourself slipping, when you let one prayer go, when you let one salah go, you are a person who prays his five daily prayers, and if you miss one prayer, you make sure you take care of the qada, right? The make, well, you have to make it up, right? And you see yourself one day, you miss dhuhr, like, you know, I missed it one time, it's okay, I'll make it up. But then you don't make it up and you miss asr, right? And then this becomes a habit. And in your mind, you're like, it's okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ever forgiving, he'll forgive all of my sins. But now you're becoming neglectful of your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The mindset has set in, that it is okay to miss a prayer, right? So slowly, slowly your whole lifestyle will follow this set, this mindset. And then when something bad happens, you're not going to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when something bad happens. Because that's not the first thing that comes to your mind. Because Allah was not the first thing that came to your mind when you woke up in the morning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not the last thing that came to your mind before you went to sleep. Right, um, Hazrat Sheikh Mufti Taqir Usmani Sab, um, he is mashallah, he's a great scholar, he's in Pakistan, he's in Karachi, one of the most respected scholars in the, in the subcontinent, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, 
right? Um, and he was, he was talking about how making niya for the salah in the heart is important. But saying it from your mouth, you know, is not lazim. It's not necessary. You should try to do it so you don't forget and your mindset is clear. But he's like, it's not lazim, right? I remember growing up, what would happen is my mother, she would tell me, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her, she's passed away. She would be like, no, you have to say it. And, you know, we have, uh, in Urdu, we say it, some of the brothers may know, you know, ki namaz padho, char rakat, farz, kabe ki taraf, you know, and all this long, this long, long, like three, four lines. And if you miss it, then you go through again, you may, you forget, you remember what you missed and you go through. But it was programmed into the mind. And the whole thing behind that was to program your mind to make sure you're coming towards Salah, right? And, and, and it's the intention of the people, subhanAllah, the intentions are good. I'm not saying the intentions are bad. The intentions were good. It was just that, you know, a misunderstanding that it was so lazim that we have to say this three line or this whole paragraph to make sure we're ready for Salah. So the, it's, it's creating a mindset. That what the, that's what the intention behind that was, to create the mindset that whenever anything happens, when we get in the car, we read subhanallah We read the whole dua of uh, the dua of suffer, the dua of traveling, right? Um, one day my car messed up a little bit. It was giving us a hard time and then it started working properly. The next morning, we were going to school. It was my son, my daughter was two. You guys have seen her and you guys have seen him. He's five. And we were driving to school. The whole way, for 10 minutes, my son read the dua. He's like, yesterday the car messed up. Today I'm going to make sure by means of my dua it doesn't mess up. SubhanAllah, it didn't mess up. But, you know, he made sure he read the dua. It's the mindset. It's honestly, it's the mindset. When we build that mindset, this is why we're so hard on our kids a lot of times. Make sure you pray. Make sure you pray. As soon as you get back from school, make sure you pray. Because when we build that mindset, if we're not watching over them, this is, this is honestly what all of the parents are trying to do. When we're not watching over our parents, we want to make sure they're taking care of their hukuk, taking care of their hukukullah, their rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're taking care of them. So this is the mindset which we're building, right? If Rehan Bai tells his son who's sitting right there, he tells him from the time he's five to the time he's 20, pray, 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 pray. Yes, does it, does it get pretty annoying at times? Yes, it does. My dad used to tell me all the time, pray, 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 pray. Right? Sometimes even now, if I don't go to the masjid, I was here for Aisha last night. My dad's probably thinking I didn't come for Aisha at all, but I was here. And he'll ask me, he's like, how come you didn't come for Aisha? Like I was at ISGC, I was, you know, leading over there. Oh, okay, that's fine. Right? But the mindset is, I'm 35 years old, but my dad still asks me if he doesn't see me for a prayer. Where were you? Right? So the fathers are looking out for the sons. The mothers are looking out for the sons and daughters. The fathers are looking out for their sons and daughters. It's this care, this genuine concern that how can I make sure that my child or myself, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always on my tongue. You know, always on my tongue, always on my mind, always in my heart. That is the main concern, right? Um, in Surah Yusuf, it says, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَلَمُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ um, He replied, I complain of my anguish and sorrow only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I know from Allah what you do not know. Right? What مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ What you do not know. Abdul Aziz Rahmatullah Ali reported Sabit and I entered the home of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu and Sabit said, Oh Abu Hamza, I am complaining of pain. Anas said, Shall I not invoke over you with the incantation of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a dua. <coughs> Peace and blessings be upon him. Sabit radiallahu said, Of course. Anas said, Oh Allah, the Lord of the people, the banisher of pain, heal it for you are the healer. There is no healing but your healing. A healing that leaves no trail of illness. This is from Bukhari. So, and we're reading the hadith, we're reading the ayat of the Qur'an, it keeps on leading us back to one thing. Whenever we need anything, and this is, today the topic obviously was not, it wasn't supposed to be because of this brother's wife being sick, but in general it was supposed to be whenever we feel any sort of emotional, physical illness, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I myself, I've been sick for the past three, four days, you know, because of the weather changing, like, you know, the sinuses, they're kicking in. Um, so, but what do we do? Do we just go to the cabinet, look up whichever medicine we have, NyQuil, Mucinex, whatever, and take that? Or do we first make dua? Do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me shifa, and then we take the medicine, right? Anytime anything happens, we make the dua, and then we take the medicine. Because we know that the shifa doesn't come from the medicine, we know the shifa only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it can be by means, by means, ma تحت الاسباب, by means of this medicine. So we always have to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
in whatever we have. And this, this all comes from laying down that foundation, that strong foundation. And you know, we spoke about it a few weeks ago, I believe, where I said, if you put in all of the cement to make a really strong building, you put the rebar down. I know there's probably some construction people here, and I hope I'm not saying anything wrong. You put down the rebar, you put down the, the good high quality concrete, you know, I, I don't know what are the gradings of it. You put all of that down. And then you lay the building on top of that. You know, you put a metal building on top of that, like we have next door. They say your foundation is so strong, you won't see a crack in it in 50 years. <coughs> this is what they promise. A crack happens five years later. What are you going to do? You're going to pick up the phone and call the construction brother. Brother, you said 50 years. This didn't even last five years. Come fix it now. He made you a promise of 50. It cracked in five, right? He can't promise anything. I can't promise you anything. If I'm, if I'm a financial analyst and I promise you these investments that you make, they will gar they're guaranteed to bring you money for the rest of your life. The next day, the stock market tanks and all of your money goes down to negative. You're looking at me like, what did you just do? You, you gave me a promise and a guarantee that my money, won't, my money won't drown, and it did. We can't give these guarantees. But if we look towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the help and the guidance and... Uh, if we're ill, we look for the shifa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will guaranteed come to you. It will guaranteed come to you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give it to you in this dunya, He will recompense you in the hereafter with better than what you had in this dunya. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu reported the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say in his supplications, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disability and sloth, cowardice and senility, hardness of the heart and negligence, dependence and humiliation and misery. I seek refuge in you from poverty and disbelief, wickedness and discord, hypocrisy and fame-seeking and ostentation. I seek refuge in you from deafness and dumbness, insanity and contagion, leprosy and evil ailments. So whatever it is, we have to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to lay that base down strong. And this is why we're having this Thursday night class that alhamdulillah a few of the brothers came to last night is to put down that foundation so strong that no one can shake you by means of any question, right? The other day I had a session with the Shaykh and I discussed this last night. Brother Marcus was here. A few of the other brothers were here last night. And uh, many times people, they bring up this, this opposition to Islam that they try to place an accusation against our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, right? They try to place an accusation. They talk about his marriages, his multiple marriages. They talk about his marriage to Aisha radiallahu They bring up all of these things to give us a hard time. To give us as Muslims a hard time. Because they can't bring up any real accusations against his character. His character was so good. Did you ever hear of any stories of the Quraysh placing blame on his character? No. The, the, the Jews of uh, Medina, did they place any accusations against his character? No. The hypocrites of Medina, no, nobody's placing any accusations against his character. Most of the books these days of the seerah that you find in the bookshelves and libraries, they're not even written by Muslims. They're written by non-Muslims and they have so much muhabbat, they have so much love of the beloved Prophet Muhammad They're writing 500 page books on the life of a man that they don't even believe in him. Subhanallah. They don't believe in him. They don't believe in his message. They don't believe in anything. But his character and his story is so amazing that although they have disbelief, they have belief in who he is. SubhanAllah, it's so ajeeb. So they're looking at his lifestyle. They're looking at everything. And they're reporting how he interacted with the people, right? So when I was talking with the Shaykh the other night, Ustad William, he said, if somebody asks you one of these questions, right? Never flinch. Be like, so what? So what? When the Quraysh came to Abu Bakr anhu, trying to test him, that, oh, do you believe a man can travel from here to Al-Quds and he can go to the heavens and all this? And he knows that they're asking about our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He didn't flinch. He didn't flinch. So when somebody tries to test your Islam, somebody tries to test your Iman, your foundation should be so strong, you don't flinch. Okay, so what is your point? If they're coming and attacking you, I'm not saying if somebody's kindly asking you a question, if they're kindly asking you, kindly answer them back. Or tell them, I don't have the answer right now, I'll get the answer and I'll come back to you. But if somebody is attacking your Islam and your Iman, you don't take a step back. I'm not saying attack them, but you put up your defenses, right? You don't just lay down, and say, oh, okay, you're right. You put up your defense and you're like, no, so what? What is your point? What is the point you're trying to make? Are you trying to place an accusation against my beloved Prophet Muhammad Do you know his seerah? Do you know his shamayim? 
Have you read his qasas? Have you read anything that you're placing these vast accusations against him? 10 out of 10 times, not even gonna say 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10 times they won't even know what they're really talking about. And they won't, wouldn't have read anything. So never back down and never let anybody attack your Islam so you feel like you're on the back foot. Immediately you put up your defenses. And how can we put up the defenses? Is when we have firm faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have firm faith in our pillars, and we have firm faith in the Sirat and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we really need to spend time and enhance ourselves in these matters. And if we're not doing it, we're doing a disservice to ourselves. Because these questions will continue to come up. And if we're not able to answer them by the correct means of the Quran and the Sunnah, we will always be taking the back foot and we will always always be stepping back instead of stepping forward and telling people the truth. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq, may he give us a better understanding, and may he forgive us for all of our sins of omission and commission. And please make dua for brother Sayyid Rafi's wife. Um, she is yeah. ill. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us shifai kamil wa ajana wa istamirah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.